evening's uh, special uh, OPLC meeting, um, and um, you should have the agenda before you. And the uh, one topic for this evening is um, uh, having a conversation with Chief Meidel. And at this point, I would like to have a, a motion to accept this evening's um, special um, meeting agenda. I will move the agenda for tonight. Okay. And a second, please. I second. Thank you. Okay. Uh, with the commissioners uh, currently present, um, please indicate that your approval of this evening's um, special meeting agenda by um, indicating with I. 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 Okay. okay. Thank you. Okay. And um, uh, I'll do the introductions here. And I'd like to uh, begin first with the um, OPO um, staff. We have Christina Cody and we have. Uh, Bart Logue, our uh, OPO, um, and our, our deputy OPO is um, uh, Louis May Omana. And the commissioners this evening, we have uh, Jenny Rose, we have Lily uh, Navarrete, and myself, uh, Lad Smith, and we have uh, our legal counsel, David Bingaman. And I think I have everyone. And then uh, a special welcome to Chief Meidel. Um, Chief, thank you so much for for um, accepting this invitation. I, I realize your time is is precious, and I'm undoubtedly you've had a full day. And for you to reserve the end of your day to spend with us is is really, really uh, appreciated. And so, thank you. Um, okay. And uh, we're expecting possibly two more commissioners, uh, Chief, to join us, and um, they they hopefully will be here momentarily. But um, I think we should just go ahead and begin um, because we do have a quorum. And I, I guess the way to go this evening um, might be maybe Chief have a, a introduction of um, some thoughts that you have um, around policing in Spokane right now. Um, I, I think what I, I do want to keep in mind what prompted uh, us to ask you to join us this evening uh, goes back to an uh, op-ed that you wrote uh, back in mid-February or sometime in February, and and we looked at that, um, discussed at our last meeting, and, and it really raised uh, some interesting questions, wonderings, and um, and so um, I, I suspect that there'll be um, some uh, thoughts and maybe questions around uh, the op-ed, and I also know there's stuff going on in the legislature, um, and. Um, so anyway, um, Commissioner Jasmine, um, good to have you with us this evening, and thank you for being here. And so, Chief Michael, if you want to um, maybe open with um, some thoughts and, and um, anything that you want to share with us this evening. Absolutely. Thank you all very much, and uh, appreciate uh, Mr. Smith calling out. Yeah, definitely every day is a fairly long day. So I apologize. I wasn't able to make a regular meeting, so I am going to be at training next week. The FBI is going to pay to try to teach me leadership skills. Um, so they are flying me out. I'll be gone all next week. I think they have their work cut out for them. And then um, I'm actually getting an operation on my shoulder for a couple different things uh, as soon as I get back. So I'll be out for three weeks after that. So um, thanks for making this uh, a special meeting for me. Um, I have so much information to cover. I try to anticipate as much as I could of what I thought may be of interest. I'm surrounded by all kinds of sheets and paperwork. Uh, it's it's truly a disaster if you were to see my office. Um, let's start with. Um, a couple things I'll go over some some highlights here. Uh, Mr. Logan and I talked about some things that may be of interest, and then I'm definitely happy to to answer any questions or have a conversation about anything else you may be of interest. So, a uh, letter to the editor. Uh, you know, COVID has presented a lot of unique challenges at so many different levels, uh, and and it's no different with a lot of the legislation occurring right now. Uh, in Olympia, we see a lot of, of bills, specifically a lot of police reform bills. And um, I'll tell you, I know that in Spokane, the city specifically, uh, the majority of the community, tremendous support for the Spokane Police Department, right? In, in 2019, uh, they passed a, a levy by uh, almost 70%, and they said, we want to pay more taxes to hire more police officers. So this was two years ago. 
typically the community is not going to pay money out of their own pocket to hire something they want less of. Um, so that, that's something that we know there is a, a tremendous amount of support for the agency here in Spokane. Um, it's taken a, a long time for us to get to where we're at, um, and it's really a journey. It's never a destination. Just when you think you've got something nailed down, you're finding out, well, there's a best practice somewhere else in the country. So we saw a wave of police reform bills uh, sweeping through Olympia. And, and um, my experience, having been a in the police department for 27 years, uh, chief of police for almost five years, is that uh, I truly strongly believe, and I'd say in my heart, know that some of those bills are likely going to have the opposite effect than I think some of the legislator, legislators intended. The primary bill that first came out that was of the biggest concern was the, the police tactics bill. Um, and that's the one that my letter to the editor, editor was specifically focused at. Um, in, including that bill are things such as uh, pursuits, regulating pursuits statewide, having a statewide standard, um, the use of, of deck restraints or chokeholds, uh, the use of tear, tear gas, the use of armored vehicles such as the Bearcat, the MRAP, um, and there's a couple other things in there. I, I, I'm skipping my mind. So for me, uh, again, starting at the oh, canine use, the, the use of the canine is going to be closely regulated. So looking at uh, a lot of the proposals that, that were in the initial draft, um, I truly believe that some of them were actually going to lead to probably more injuries for officers, more injuries for community. Uh, and give you an example on the neck restraint. In Spokane City, we've allowed the use of the neck restraint for several decades. They used it 60s, 70s, went away for, for, from it for a while, and then it came back uh, again about 25 years ago in the city of Spokane. So we've used that now uh, for probably close to 25 years. Um, we use it on, we have two, two levels of the neck restraint. We call it level one, level two. Level one is really more of a control technique. Uh, typically, we're fighting folks that are violently resisting. Um, they have either mental health issues, extremely strong, or they have uh, drugs on board. They have no pain, pain tolerance, no pain compliance, or they have alcohol on board. Uh, so the level one is really just more of a control technique or controlling the upper body. The level two is where your intent is actually to put this person to sleep. Uh, we only authorize the level two at the assaultive level. Um, it is not used very often, but when it is used, again, no injuries, absolutely no deaths, uh, no injuries uh, to uh, not only the officer, but also to the person that we're trying to get in, into custody. So when you look at something that evolved the Ninth Circuit, oh, I don't know, probably somewhere around 15 years ago, use of force used to be on a continuum. We all have heard of the use of force continuum. Very, very popular when I first got hired. Um, what you saw nationwide was best practices was to go away from what's called a continuum. Uh, they said use of force is um, very dynamic, right? So a lot of times what they found was that officers felt like they could, um, they had to start here and no matter what was occurring, move up this use of force continuum or likewise they would start up at the top if there was a deadly force situation and feel like they would just escalate down as opposed to you may start at the bottom and go immediately to the top. You may start at the top and immediately go to the bottom. So all of that to say departments, uh, most departments across the nation went away from the use of force continuum as a best practice. Um, and, and we followed suit as well, especially when the Department of Justice Cops Collaborative Reform was initiated here in Spokane. So the, the Ninth Circuit started, came out with a new concept about 15 years ago where they said there's uh, basically a, a, what's called an intermediate level of force. And an intermediate level of force means you're not getting compliance, you're not at the deadly force or substantial bodily injury level, but you're somewhere in the middle. So when you look at the neck restraint, what we call the neck restraint, which has been used in judo since the late 1800s, uh, my understanding in judo tournaments, it's allowed at the age of 14, they've had no deaths or serious injuries in judo. Um, it's used in thousands of tournaments every year with no deaths, no serious injuries. This was something that we placed in the uh, what's called the intermediate level of force. So if you only have so many tools in the low level of force, so many tools available in the intermediate, and then very few tools at the deadly force substantial bodily injury level, if you remove, it's a, it's, it's a simple mathematical equation to me. If you remove one tool from the middle, that's one less tool you have to resolve whatever scenario you're in. So typically if an officer 
could have used that lower level of force, they would have used that. So if they're at the intermediate level of force and none of those tools are using it, and now you have one less tool to use, statistically, mathematically, it is conceivable that you may end up having to go to that next level more than you would have because you've lost an intermediate level tool. Um, I feel like really as a, as a society and even as a community, we should be trying to put more tools into that intermediate level not less tools. So that that was the genesis for the neck restraint. Um, when it comes to the canine deployment, um, that was actually removed from the bill in Olympia and uh, the legislator, I believe uh, Goodman was a part of that, said, let's put together a study session. And um, he said, I didn't realize there's a lot of different layers and levels to this intricacy. So he's, he wants to have a study session related to uh, canine applications. Uh, the the bear cat was reintroduced. You know the bear cat is basically just a shield on wheels. Um, we we use it to allow us to get closer to a house where someone who may be armed is contained. We definitely don't want them leaving the house and getting out into the community or the neighborhood um, because then we can't control their movements or where they're going. Uh, it, it's ours has been hit by bullets at least on one occasion as well. And so the best way to look at it is just look at it as something that can stop bullets that allows us to get closer to uh, a residence or someone who may be armed. Um, very effective tool. So that was that was removed as a prohibition, or I should say, tightly regulated prohibition, uh, probably somewhere like a month ago. The MRAPs remained in the bill until I understand uh, last week. That is still going to be allowed. The MRAP is that, as most of you know, it's a mine resistant vehicle. We don't own one. The county does own one. Um, similar concept, it's way bigger than what we have or what we can typically use in the city because we're a dense urban area. Our alleys are, are fairly narrow, uh, but that was also removed as well. Uh, tear gas. So when most people right now in the season that we're in, when they think of tear gas, they think of riots and protests in Seattle and Portland. Um, we have used tear gas one time in the, in the last couple of decades. Um, the only other time I remember us using that in my 27 years was there was a venue downtown where there was a music group. You had rival gang members come. Alcohol was served. Very bad combination. Alcohol, rival gangs, the venue closed. They spilled down in the street. Huge fight. Uh, officers were probably outnumbered 1 to 20, 1 to 30. Uh, they gave a dispersal order. And um, again, you're in the middle of downtown Spokane on a, a weekend night. Uh, that was used probably, I want to say, maybe 25 years ago. Other than that, the only time we've used it for crowd control measures per se was May 31st of last year. Here's where we do use it though. We get a call of a domestic, and, and this is a, a not an uncommon scenario. We get a call of a domestic violence. A suspect has uh, secreted himself in the attic of the residence, has a knife, has a gun. Well, we know that if we try to crawl into that attic, bad things are gonna happen. Um, we don't know where this person exactly is. It's dark, it's confined. Um, so using that as an example, um, we will try to get them to come out of the attic into an area that we control where we can be behind cover. We have more options to, to see compliance, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that was, that is, um, now we are allowed to use that. And the caveat is, and I haven't seen if it's changed yet. But my understanding is a supervisor has to authorize that. That just changed within the last week. It used to be either the chief or the sheriff of any entity in Washington that had to authorize every deployment. I wasn't really excited about getting called at two or three in the morning and trying to figure out what was going on. Uh, but now they're going to allow an on-site supervisor to be the one to authorize that. The pursuits, the pursuits um, at the at the state level, what they're looking at, it really doesn't impact us about, um, Bart will probably remember better than I will, but probably about two years ago, we updated our pursuit policy. Uh, we used to allow pursuits for, um, well, when I first got hired, you could pursue for anything, expired tabs, that then changed to felonies. Uh, we updated our, our pursuit policy probably two years ago. You could pursue for violent crimes, crimes of violence. Um, or if someone has a warrant for a crime of violence, robber, uh, felony robbery, you know, assaults, things like that, but not for Department of Corrections warrants, only if the warrant is for the initial crime. Uh, the that, that prong of the bill is not really going to impact us a whole lot because we're already there as a city. Where it will impact us, and again, I'm hoping this will be modified at some level. Every single pursuit has to be authorized by a supervisor. Uh, and uh, so a lot of these smaller counties and smaller jurisdictions don't have a supervisor on duty. Or if an officer has someone who has a, a warrant, or I'm sorry, an officer has someone uh, with probable cause for second degree robbery. You have the vehicle, 
he's starting to take off. What does the officer do until that supervisor can approve it? He, either the supervisor's at the station on paperwork, reports, uh, tied up on another call. So there's some some areas that, that need to be looked at because technically you're not supposed to pursue unless the supervisor says, yes, you can pursue in this scenario. And if the officer or deputy were to pursue without supervisory authority, technically they would be outside the, the, ram, the um, parameters of the bill. Um, those are the the big things that I remember from from that bill, um, and that was my response to the uh, the neck restraint as well. I will tell you, um, I truly believe in my heart it is not going to make our community safer, uh, and that's based on 25 years of of data and usage in the city of Spokane. Um, I have used it three times in my entire career. Uh, people much bigger, much stronger, uh, and having had a lot of drugs on board. And uh, there probably would have been a lot more damage to everyone involved had that tool not been available. Um, um, Chief Meinl, if, if you don't mind me uh, interjecting at this point, um, uh, you, you um, gave a really good um, summary of what's going on in the legislature. And if I'm wondering um, if we have any, any questions, uh, does anyone have any uh, clarifying questions, any comments, anything that you want to um, ask the chief or about what he just said. I, I guess I have w one question that um, going back to the, you called it a, a bear cat? The bear cat. Okay. And, and was is that something that, um, that was ascertained from the military or is that something that's standard in police departments? Um, you know, I wouldn't say it's standard. They're, they're fairly expensive. Um, we, we received a grant probably again ballpark 10 years ago for the sheriff in the police department to share one bear cat. Uh, the challenge became when the sheriff had something going on and they needed it and we had something going on, it wasn't available, uh, but we knew that this individual was uh, barricaded in a house, they had a gun, so it wasn't uncommon we would call um, Kootenai County, hey, can we borrow your bear cat? So that's kind of, um, it, it's a civilian armored vehicle that um, really just stops bullets. Um, the MRAP, the MRAP is the, the big, I mean, you, you've probably seen these on the, the movies, especially as we're, we're talking about more of the Desert Shield, Desert Storm era, actually came after that. They've got the big tires, probably four foot tires, and uh, the, the bottoms of them angle up. So it, it's it's fairly big. Yeah. So is, is the, um, has the Spokane Police Department taken any equipment from the military? Um, and if so, yeah. what, what types of equipment has been? Yeah, we, we've gotten, um, and it's been a while, we've gotten um, hand-me-down helmets from them um, for our crowd control team. This was probably, again, 15 plus years ago. Uh, we received um, some of the older body armor um, that really, and the body armor for the military, typically, and, and this may have changed. Um, when I was in, they were flak jackets. They were made to stop shrapnel, not rifle rounds or anything like that. Um, but when we had a limited budget for equipment, we used the flak jacket. I believe we may have gotten a handful of night vision goggles from them as well. Uh, absolutely no offensive weapons, no firearms, no rifles, no pistols, uh, nothing along those lines. It's all been really more of the protective defensive uh, type equipment that we would get from them. And then I, I think I heard you say about the tear gas. Uh, I was surprised to hear this, that in, in the last 25 years, you think it's only been used Maybe once for that twice. event, twice. Uh, twice for crowd control events in, in yeah. my memory, yeah. So and on the night of the May 31st, was there any consideration given as to an alternative? Um, I'm, I'm talking as a novice here, I wasn't there, and so I don't, I, I don't understand being in your shoes. Um, was that just the go-to um, for, that, for that event, or was there anything else considered or could have been considered? Yeah, so that's um, and, and please interject if I if I go on too long. Um, that was. We, we had never had anything along those lines in Spokane, probably in the history of Spokane, certainly not since the time I've been here. Uh, we anticipated what was going to be a, a peaceful rally, a peaceful protest uh, being led by um, some of our community leaders with uh, Black Lives Matter and, and some of those entities. Uh, and again, which, which, hap which happened during the daytime, right? That, that did happen during daylight hours. Okay. Yes, that's correct. So if, uh, if you call, I believe the incident was scheduled to start at one o'clock. 
Uh, we originally had our officers across the street on Spokane by the red wagon. So we originally had our officers in what we call their soft uniform. That's the uniform they wear every day, standing across the street, make sure everything stays safe. They weren't right uh, on the same side as the red wagon. Um, they're there as a presence, keep the peace, let folks exercise their First Amendment right. Just before the first speaker started at one o'clock, there was an individual, and there were thousands of people packed in there shoulder to shoulder. Uh, just before the event started, there's one individual that started basically punching people. Uh, we had grossly insufficient numbers of officers to try to go in and arrest this person based on the number of people that were there. So when the officer uh, or when the individual started to make his way outside the large group, uh, the officers moved in to arrest him. This person is, is punching and swinging at all these individuals that are there. When the officers moved in to arrest him, uh, there's a surge of people that came across Spokane Falls Boulevard, surrounded the officers. Um, obviously, our goal was to try to get that person out of there as quickly as we can. Based on the, the vitriol, the, the yelling, uh, the uh, anger, everything that had manifested, uh, they, they kept encroaching on the officers. Um, we realized this is something we've never seen before. I should back up. Prior to one o'clock, uh, we had officers obviously out throughout the downtown area. They saw individuals carrying cartons of milk. Now, I didn't know until that night what the milk was for, and I found out that night that is used to wash tear gas out of your eyes. Um, there was um, gallons of water that were pre-staged in certain areas. Uh, we saw individuals with um, protest signs that had straps on the back. So if you looked at the front, it looked like a protest sign. But um, when you looked behind it, you could see that they had basically hooks for their arms. They could use it as a shield. Uh, there are individuals that had helmets. There's one individual with a, an umbrella that had a huge spike coming out of it. So, so we knew even before one o'clock, uh, having never seen anything like this before, this is a different crowd. This is this is different than what we've ever seen. These are people that are pre-staging uh, things that to, to rinse their eyes out. Again, mind you, we've never used tear gas in a crowd control in that setting ever. Uh, we had individuals with uh, makeshift weapons. We had individuals with signs that had straps on the back to use them as shields. So that was our first kind of warning. And then when we moved to arrest this person, the number of people that came across the street kept encroaching, encroaching. So we, we worked through that. Uh, the, the bulk of the group then started to march down west down Spokane Falls Boulevard towards the courthouse, the public safety campus here. Um, there was a, another group who stayed back and basically continued to yell and confront and cuss and everything else at the officers that were still standing on the opposite side of the street as the red wagon. And we could tell based on demeanor and everything that the level of tension was uh, palpable. It was it was very thick. Um, so uh, the group eventually ended up joining the larger group at the public safety campus. Um, at that point, uh, wisdom dictated, okay, you guys, this is a completely different environment. Um, so at that point, we told them instead of staying in their, their soft uniform, fall back, get into your other gear, and we'll uh, we'll continue to monitor the group as it's at the public safety campus. And you had really the, the June, uh, juvenile, you had the detention services and sheriff's office primarily handling the, the security around the public safety campus. Uh, while they were um, while they were here giving speeches, there were a few groups in the back that were throwing rocks and bricks at at the deputies and at the jailers at our officers as well. Uh, we tried to send in some some officers to determine who they were, but um, we weren't able to figure out who they were. So then, after several hours, about three hundred individuals, three four hundred individuals broke off from that main group and started marching down Monroe Street in downtown. And, and mind you, this is around four ish, five o'clock in the the evening a lot of traffic out on the streets. Um, so they started to march up and down, zigzag through the downtown area. Our direction was, because we have a lot of one ways, try to block the streets so cars don't run these people over. So our goal was to allow them to just continue to march through the downtown, blocking streets, blocking traffic. Um, however, um, members of this group then started throwing things at our police cars uh, and spray painting our police cars, et cetera, et cetera. So we then told them fall back further, try to stay a block, at least a block away from them. Um, if it looks like they're getting close, fall back further. This group marched down to the, the federal courthouse. Uh, and by that time we'd had a couple of our police cars damaged, window broke, started to tag the federal courthouse. I've, we've got some pretty good photos. Um, but at that point in time, even, even then our, our staff that we had available to address that 
probably outnumbered easily one to uh, one to five to one to ten, maybe one to one to ten. So we knew we couldn't go in and, and stop this group from tagging graffiti on the, the federal courthouse. Um, so we basically were in a, a stand back mode uh, monitoring them. The group then marched down to in front of uh, River Park Square. Same thing, block the streets. Uh, we try to keep traffic from driving through them. Um, what I'm in the sand was was when the group broke into the Nike store, and we'd already seen what had happened in in other jurisdictions. Uh, that takes off like wildfire when they start breaking into businesses and buildings and looting. That's when we know it takes off like wildfire. So that was our line in the stand. I gave a dispersal order, gave multiple dispersal orders. Um, didn't have uh, an effect on very many. I think there may have been a small handful um, that left. Um, and then uh, our initial deployment was actually smoke. Uh, you know, and, and we were watching a live feed. You know, some of them were, were coughing like it was gas. It was smoke. We're trying to let them know we're serious and you need to leave. I mean, then that's when our officers started having uh, bricks and rocks and bottles and all these different things thrown at them. Um, and actually, if I'd thought of it, I've got some pretty good photos of individuals that were in the process of throwing things at our officers. Um, there's a, a couple people there. We've got photos of this with uh, leaf blowers, the big leaf blowers. Um, so when they would not disperse and, and our officers were getting pelted with things, um, they deployed the, then they deployed gas dispersal order given unlawful assembly. We were not able to control that big of a group. So they would retreat 100 feet, 200 feet, reposition, <laughs> start throwing things at officers again, um, and then the process repeated. And that repeated basically all night long up until probably 11, 1130. Um, our officers were attempting to, well, let me back up. We did not have the resources to go in and, and get the individual people that were throwing things. And uh, from my perspective in the command post, other people were standing there while behind them, you have people throwing things at our officers. So the people in front were in essence acting as a human shield while the people behind them were targeting our officers. Um, so that's what that's where the dispersal order comes in. It's like you're 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 acting as a human shield while our, our officers are getting pelted. We told you to leave. And so that's when the gas gets deployed. We attempted to, to target the individuals that were throwing the items. Um, we asked for mutual aid, uh, which we eventually got. It took quite a while uh, from Kootenai County uh, and from Tri-Cities, uh, Kennewick, and um, Benton County as well. It took them quite a while to get there. Um, so this, this process of getting pelted with bricks and rocks, and um, one of our officers uh, told me after the fact, there was a, uh, a supply vehicle, and the supply vehicle was behind the big, the big crowd so that, that we couldn't get to it. Uh, one of the things he saw being thrown was a like a, a two liter bottle that had some kind of green liquid started smoking, didn't know what was in it. Um, we know that they had a communication equipment, a level of sophistication that goes on in other cities. This happens in Seattle and Portland. We've never seen that level of sophistication here with people with communication, a supply vehicle. As we attempted to make a stop on the supply vehicle, people swarmed in front of the, the car, so we weren't able to make a stop. So. So when it comes to, to your question about the, the tear gas, um, there was no way for us to get the crowd to move. And, and the crowd that was staying there, again, multiple dispersal orders telling them to leave, repeated throughout the entire night. Uh, and the, a lot of the folks down there allowing themselves to, to stand in front while behind, officers were getting pelted with things. So uh, if there had been another way to do it, we, we certainly would have done it in, in that scenario. There's no other way, just with the, the sheer numbers of folks that were still there based on our limited number of officers. It's just yeah. no way that we can do it. Um, um, Chief Model, I, I really appreciate um, getting the context. Um, um, you know, you get bits, you get bits of um, information from different media outlets or, or, you know, what have you, but to hear you uh, describe in its entirety, you know, um, what you were facing, uh, it, it gives us uh, a context and I appreciate that. Absolutely. Um, um, yes, Commissioner Navarrete has a, a question or comment. Thank you. Um, I have a couple of comments and one question, uh, Chief Mido. Um The first comment is I was at the BLM um, event and I was there since 1230. Um, we were one of the supporters um, and activists and um, a lot of uh, people that I know um, were 
injured because of the, the gas. Um, the other comment is, um, I think, comparing the chokehold to judo is uh, a bit extreme because um, it's it's not it's not the same. Um, it I I know about martial arts and that is just not a, a good comparison um, for the chokehold. Um, how are these events working? Um, or how are your officers, including yourself, using de-escalation? Yeah, the, the, the de-escalation, um, you know, one of the things, and, and let me, we'll, we'll agree to disagree on the, the uh, neck restraint. Judo actually is based on a form of unarmed combat that traces its its history back hundreds of years. And uh, one of the things with Judo is, is if you look at the history of it, is the, the uh, common the common folks weren't allowed weapons and they were being oppressed. So judo was developed and the, the neck restraint was basically taken from that process. So I, I while I appreciate your perspective, I, I truly think that it is again from our data, uh, our data for 25 years shows that it's it's not led to any deaths or serious injuries. And I would argue it has actually saved quite a few injuries. Um, and I'm happy to provide that data for you. I have a I have truly a boatload of data if you'd like to see it um, that I'm happy to provide it. I'm not, I'm not just, um, you know, I'm not just saying it because I, I think it's effective. I'm actually, actually looking at the data, but um, in terms of de-escalation, um, there's so many different prongs to that. We have had um, procedural justice training. We've had um, de-escalation training, implicit bias training, um, crisis intervention training. We're the largest department in the state where every officer has 40 hours of mandatory crisis intervention training. You'll see some that have two days or, or three days. Um, one of the things I did as well to really drive home the point of, of what our role is as a police department is um, I completely, we completely redid our values as an agency. A lot of times what you see in organizations and not just law enforcement, it can be any organization, is the CEO comes in and they sit in their ivory tower and they say, here are our values as an organization. Well, that may be the values of that CEO, that chief or sheriff or, or whoever is the chairperson, but you're, you can't compel your values on the, the individuals that work for that organization. So what I wanted to do was um, I got a cross spectrum of the entire agency and I said, you guys tell me what our values are that we strive for every day as an agency. This is what we strive for. Uh, it, it, it was commissioned, it was non-commissioned, it was line level, it was our support. The highest ranking person in there was a captain, and that was just to keep us on task. And, and the only thing, Commissioner, that I said to them was, I don't want a eight or nine values that look really good on the front of a policy manual that nobody reads and nobody understands. I said, I only want three or four, and I want three or four that we truly believe in. And I stayed out of it. My executive staff stayed out of it. So after uh, about a month and a half or two of meetings, they came back with the values of professionalism, integrity, and compassion. And those are, I, I say they're mine, but they aren't ones I came up with. Those are the ones that the department came up with. And what I tell all of our new hires as well, I am the final interview before every officer gets hired. And uh, that means they've gone through an extensive background. Uh, Chief Straub, many of you know Chief Straub, he had to go through that. He said it was, what I heard was, he said, that's on, on par with a top secret clearance, the level of, of background that we do. Um, so we've had, we spent an inordinate amount of money getting these people to the point where they're sitting across from me and I'm their final interview. And uh, what, I, what I tell them is that we have an 800 plus page policy manual. It is impossible to remember every item in that 800 page policy manual. But what I tell them, if you follow our, our values, and these are the values the department came up with, you will never be out of policy with any of the procedures or requirements of this agency. Professionalism, integrity, compassion. I even tell them, if you can't remember three, pick any two of those values, pick any two of those three values, you will never be out of compliance with our policy manual as well. Um, and the other thing I tell them is that we use force because we have to, not because we can. There are many, many times where we are authorized to use force by law, by policy, but that doesn't mean we should or that we can't, or that we, that doesn't mean that we should. Um, so 
after every use of force goes through a chain of command review, and this is something I actually stole from LAPD when I took a trip down there uh, under Chief Stroud. Every use of force goes through a separate use of force review board. So that means once a month they meet, they look at every use of force and the intent of that. My intent in having that use of force review board was to look at any application of force. And just because you could use it, did you need to? And that the intent of that is to train our officers. Are there better ways to do it? It's safer for the individual you're trying to take into custody. It's safer for you. Um, and it, we've gotten to the point where now at times we will even have the chain of command address uses of force that were within policy, but didn't necessarily need to be applied before it even gets all the way through the chain of command. So it's it's that it's a culture change that that we're working on here. Um, we have um, we have here's the thing we struggle with with tracking um, de escalation to get to your question as well is we don't have any any box that we check of I de escalated this person. Um, it's one of the things we're talking about trying to determine um, how do we track that. You know, we don't want to do the straw that broke the camel's back. We collect so much data and it takes so much more time that our officers are busy writing reports instead of being out there trying to keep the community safe. So we're trying to find a way to tr actually track de-escalation. Um, but uh, what I can do if, if the commission is interested as well, though, is that as I'm made aware of these, and I'm probably made aware of a fraction of the times we actually de-escalate when force would have been authorized, um, I'm happy to send those to you as they pop up on my radar as well um, and show those to you. But it is something that we're, we train on. We train on at in-service. We do what's are called RBI reality-based, um, or I'm sorry, RBT reality-based training. So we also train on them, train them on um, de-escalating. And uh, sometimes, sometimes just leaving. This is not a police issue. You know, police get called on to handle so many different aspects of, of what's going on to society. And uh, I think you're seeing a big push now to try to take some of that stuff off of law enforcement's plate. Things that we shouldn't be going on, but there's been nobody else there to fill the gap. So it's something we continue to work on. Um, it's so important to us too that we actually, uh, I don't know of any other agencies that's, that has done this. We actually have a separate de-escalation policy. So a lot of times you'll see de-escalation principles incorporated into the use of force policy. We actually wanted it to be a separate policy to really call out how important it is for our agency. So there's a lot of different variables. There's a lot of cogs at the wheel. And again, it goes to what I said earlier, where it's a journey. It's not a destination. It's something we'll keep training on. I, I will tell you, we're by no means perfect. Um, I, one super duper quick example. This is just an example that pops into mind. Um, this was an incident that last year. Officer uh, contacted someone, had a warrant, and uh, confirmed that the warrant existed with a, with radio, um, and then told him he was under arrest and moved in to arrest him. The guy took off running. There was a scuffle, and his backup was maybe 30 seconds, a minute away. Technically, he didn't violate policy. He told the guy, the guy he was under arrest, the guy didn't comply. He took off running, um, which the officer had no idea that he would. But as an example of the things that we're doing is that um, the patrol captain told the sergeant, you know, you need to tell him next time, wait for backup. Your backup's 30 seconds away. It's not going to hurt you to wait for backup when you can. So those are the types of things that we're that we're doing, and we're we're seeing more and more of that. And, and don't get me wrong, we still got a ways to go, um, but the momentum is is there. I have a question from Commissioner Jasmine. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chief Mydal, for uh, coming and talking to us today. Absolutely. Uh, I kind of have like a two part question and they're totally different too. Um, one is obviously there's, um, there's a, I don't know how to word it, but there's, there's kind of a lack of trust. There's some repairing of trust that needs to happen between the community. <laughs> and, um, hi, sweetie. Yeah. Let me, let me finish real quick. Um, so, uh, there's 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 clearly some work that needs to be done uh, with the community and us and uh, with the police department. So, what in your mind? What are some things that can be done, and are there areas that um, your department is looking at to really help with that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's that's a good question, and this has been a struggle for I think for for law enforcement. And again, I I, I feel like almost everyone is tired of hearing the word COVID. Um, 
but when we had the, the stay home, stay healthy order from the governor about 11 months ago, could not get together in large groups, essential personnel only could work. Um, it really absolutely eliminated almost overnight the ability for us to get together in groups. And I know that we all try to plug the gap by doing things like this. I, I heard someone refer to this once as, as the Brady Bunch thing where you got faces and boxes. And that that's okay. It's not the same. You don't establish relationships on looking at three inch boxes of people's faces, but it, it fills the gap as well as it can. Um, so COVID and the lockdowns across the really across the globe has really hurt a lot of relationships as well. So one of the things though too, um, they're, they're, that that distrust you first of all you have to acknowledge that that is there is to begin with and um, I think you know we've acknowledged that I've been doing this now for almost five years and um, I will tell you I spent probably I feel like I spent probably a good two to three years of trying to go to everything to be at everything um, to listen and, and just to be present um, and then you had uh, you know the incident that happened last year where you saw riots explode across the nation. And I'll be honest with you, our department was um, stunned, hurt, crushed, sad, uh, frustrated, uh, because up until then, we felt like, you know what, again, we were not there, but we felt like we'd made a lot of progress. And something happened 1,100 miles away when we'd been having a lot of great relationships. We've been having a lot of great conversations, you know, Pastor, um, Pastor uh, Sean Davis, Walter Kendricks, um, Lonnie Mitchell, we had these great relationships. We were talking with them routinely. They were calling me on the phones if they had questions. And then all of a sudden something happened and we see the protests and we're sitting there thinking, we had a great relationship and something happened and, and not perfect. I'm not saying it's perfect by any means. Um, I would never say that. Um, but then all of a sudden something happened 1100 miles away and we're like, we were going so strong. We were, We had this amazing relationship. And then it's like, Everyone just disappeared. We're like, what happened? We're still here. We're still the same department we were a week ago before all this stuff happened. So what we we've tried to do is is work through COVID, and and working through things like this to establish that relationship. And um, we're we're working with a, another group right now, and and I don't know that they necessarily are are ready to to come out publicly, but um, there's another group of Black community leaders that we're working with. We're going to have our um, second meeting in about a week and a half. Um, there's also the, as, as you all probably know, uh, the, the mayor and council president begs put together, or put, have put together a committee on police reform for here locally. Um, that was originally supposed to go this week. I have not had an updated date on when that's going to occur, but that will also have a lot of the community leaders of, of spectrum from the community. Absolutely impossible to get everyone there. We would need probably the arena to have every voice heard who wants to be heard, but, um. That will be occurring. We also have what we call our um, uh, YPI youth and police initiative and, and the youth and police initiative is a program where we will go into the high schools. We will work with the counselors, the school staff. Um, and um, look at who are some kids that are struggling. They're, may, they're maybe at a crossroads in their life and we'll, we'll take the input from the, the counselors and the school staff of individuals who may be struggling. Um, and try to keep it to about a dozen. I think the largest we have is 15, but that's so we can have the more of the one on one and we spend a week with them. And, and I'm going to be honest with you. We bribe them. We offer them. I think it's 75 dollars if they can if they can come the whole week. Um, and it's really about building bridges. It's about us listening to their perspective, us explaining our perspective and not agreeing to agree on stuff, but at least just listening responsibly, listening respectfully. It, it's small. But all great things, uh, all great things have small beginnings. So we've done that now for probably about five years, groups of dozens, uh, groups of a dozen or so. We've done it at every high school. We've done it at Crosswalk. We've done it at Excelsior. Um, we've done it at the Salish School. Um, so that's something we'll do about every month. Of, of course, COVID hurt that with uh, the school being shut down. And in the summer, we have the Police Activities League. This started probably eight years ago with one one event, basketball up in Hilliard. Um, well, a lot of kids don't play basketball. Um, so it has expanded to where it's at now where we, we do it for six weeks out of the summer, one day each week up in uh, Hilliard in West Central and then over at uh, Liberty Park. So three different areas once a week and we all have something like eight different events. We even try to incorporate a STEM portion as well. Um, the library participates, the school district participates. 
and it, it's basically where our officers and volunteers, those who are interested, come out. Um, and it's, it's supposed to be fun, have act, have different activities, different sports, and it uh, just kind of lowers that that barrier. When our when our officers are out in the field, they've got to screen for calls, so they can't establish those relationships on those calls. So they basically go there, just the facts, ma'am, kind of the Joe Friday thing, just the facts, ma'am. They have another ten calls waiting. What what PAL and YPI allows us to do is actually uh, not be tied to the radio and not be tied to calls and establish more of those relationships. So, um, so we have we have quite a few different things, um, and I think we're we're probably like a lot of folks waiting for the COVID restrictions to go away so we can start having these forums and community meetings again. Yeah. And so the second part. Sorry. No. So, uh, and, and a lot of our kids have definitely participated with the PALS program. Oh, uh, good. Yeah. So. Um, my last question is, I know we, we, we heard a lot of, um, the statewide, uh, policies that are being formed and are moving through. And, um, I kind of heard a lot of, um, angst and in your voice, just kind of about, um, what, what might be coming down the pike. Are there any things, uh, is there anything that you're from your standpoint, looking forward to passing that you think might be good for? Um, your department? Yeah, um, there's there's a, a bill that looks like it's going to um, actually pass both the the House and the Senate, and it's a data collection bill. Um, I, I believe, unless the bill is changed, is Wazoo will be the, the center flexion point for statewide data um, related to use of force. Um, you know, that's that's one of the things. Every community is different, right? I mean, use of force in Mercer Island or Bainbridge is going to be different than uses of force in probably in Spokane. Um, every community is different. You know, we know that there's a lot of different variables that um, are responsible for for crime. A lot of socioeconomic things. So, in Mercer Island, if you look at their their median household income, they're probably going to have a different type of force than Spokane, than Tacoma, than Yakima. But having said that, I I'm one of those those folks. As I'm a data geek, I still want to know how do we compare. Maybe maybe we don't compare Spokane to Bellevue. Or, or um, Mercer Island, but I would love to see where we're at compared to Yakima, compared to Tacoma. Tacoma is kind of a, a sister city. They're they're just slightly smaller, about the same size department. So the data collection is something I'm I'm very much looking forward to, and I think that's going to really help drive a lot of conversations. Chief, I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, I, I do have a quick question for you. Um, I, in, in one of our meetings recently, or it's been, actually been a few months ago, um, uh, Mr. Logue uh, mentioned that you had um, asked for his assistance in looking at um, what, what, you know, looking at the, the practices that happened on May 31st. And, um, and it doesn't seem to have gone anywhere. Is that something you're still interested in? In having the um, staff at the OPO do, or have you taken a different route of get you know looking have some, having an outside look into how things went? Yeah, no, I'm I'm very interested. Um, and just to to give a, a brief background on that, um, it is when that I'm looking at it, and to me, it's it's the more people we can have looking at this, the better. Uh, it doesn't mean we're going to necessarily agree, but they have a different lens. They're going to see things differently than than what we see. And if if nothing else, it will at least spark a good conversation. Um, so for me, um, I'm always willing to have other other folks look at what are we doing? What do you feel like we could have done better? Uh, what do you think we did do well? Also, right? Because we also I mean, certainly do appreciate the compliments when they come. Um, obviously, some concerns about. Um, language within the uh, the ordinance, the collective bargaining agreement, um, those concerns uh, were brought forward to me. Um, I passed those on to the city administrator. And uh, what happened was we obviously transitioned away um, from the prior city administrator, uh, Wes Crago, uh, left the city. That spot was vacant for a while. Scott Simmons was filling that spot on top of his other job uh, for many months. Um, additionally, uh, because the the city was in negotiations with the guild for the contract that at that time had been expired, I believe, for about three and a half, almost four years when this first came up. Um, I was asked by the uh, negotiating team for the city 
um, please let's not push that forward right now. We want to get the contract done. Let's not create other issues because getting the, the three and a half, four year contract settled was a priority at that point in time for the city, uh, obviously for uh, the police guild as well. Um, so they just asked if we could put that on hold. Uh, my sense is, is that with the language that's in the, the CBA now is having to review uh, totally acceptable. And uh, it's something I've, I've endorsed from from the moment uh, Mr. Logan and I first talked about it. So it's something that I think is is still relevant. Uh, I, and I have a whole list of things, but I want to be respectful of your time. Yes, yeah, thank you. Okay. And I think Ms. Rose has a, a comment. Oh, thank you, Chief Mito. I I have a couple of just curious questions. Um, I met with a good friend today, and she is she's a she's an American citizen, but she's from Vietnam. And she told me today, she said, Jenny, I'm not gonna. I used to like to go walk in the morning, but I can't do it anymore. And because she's afraid of all, you know, all the Asian American hate crimes. Have you heard, and I haven't heard anything in Spokane and maybe because I'm not looking, but have you heard any incidents of Asian American, anything going on in Spokane with that? Absolutely zero. We looked at this, um, I wanna say last week, the media had asked about it as well. We have had absolutely zero uh, hate bias complaints or crimes from any of our Asian community at all. Okay, all right. And I, and I believe we went back even a solid year on that as well and absolutely no reports at all. Okay. Um, and then my next um, curiosity is on the gangs. So in your opinion, you know, because you're always, well, lately it's these drive-by shootings with these young kids, but, in your opinion, five years in, do you think the gang uh, situation has gotten worse than it was five years ago or stayed pretty much about the same? I, uh, I would say up until, well, I would say over the last year, and this is, again, this is happening across the nation where you look at the homicides spiking again across the nation. Um, and, and I would, to me, it would seem common sense that the lockdowns we're seeing across the nation are responsible for a lot of the, the pent up frustration and anger, uh, lack of ability to socialize and to interact with your friends and your peers. And the schools don't have, uh, if they do have any touch point at all with these students, it's doing this, it's, it's looking at a screen. That's, that's, that's not filling the cup of these kids that need that filled. So, I'm convinced that the lockdowns we've seen ha has caused a, a large spike in the drive-bys and the violence that we're seeing. Um, and it's it's um, just because the socialism, the socialism, the socialization is not occurring. It's just not occurring. So up until probably um, nine months ago, maybe a year, I would say uh, I feel like it was holding fairly what what I would call fairly steady. It was still here. Um, we did not have near the drive-bys. We still had a few, but we didn't have near the drive-bys. Um, and now it has just absolutely exploded. And, and what we're seeing is um, second and third generation gang members. Um, these are the, the mid-teenagers, 16-year-olds. Um, and uh, what my, my folks are telling my staff and talking with the parents of these kids, they're saying these kids are not like us. They have, uh, and again, this is, is coming from, from my staff, they have resigned themselves to either going to prison for the rest of their life or dying. Literally, that is the only two choices that they see for them. So their lens of life is, I am either gonna go out there and I'm gonna go to prison because this person disrespected me or they're gonna get me someday. And, and that is, that's how far they see their life going. And um, it, it, we didn't get here overnight and it, it's gonna take a lot of time and it's gonna take a lot of intentionality to get them to get away from that as well. Um, so it's it's absolutely picked up here over the last nine months to year. Well, um, one of the interesting things too, though, is what, what you'd see with a lot of the gangs, and, and these are not just, I'm not just talking, you know, when, you, when we hear gangs, a lot of times folks will say, well, why are you just talking about African-Americans? I'm not, you know, in, in the city of Spokane, uh, you look at it, our gangs are every color and shade that you can imagine. Um, but I will say, though, when you're looking at the drive-bys, 
um, at least four of them have been young African American males um, that have died. Um, but we also have outlaw motorcycle gangs. Um, we have gangs that come in from outside the area. Uh, we have drugs coming into this area from um, areas that are outside of Spokane as well. Um, human trafficking is, is really starting to catch on with the gangs as well. Um, and when you look at um, the one of the largest factors in human trafficking, you'll find that a lot of the gangs are associated with trafficking, uh, typically this woman, and usually it's multiple women. Um, and it is, is as disgusting as it sounds, it was explained to me is that drugs are, you sell it and you're done with it, but you gotta go reproduce it. You gotta ship it, you gotta transport it. Uh, you gotta hope you don't get caught with it. Um, and then you gotta pay to get more so you can sell it to other people. And uh, these human traffickers look at women as a, as a, uh, a non-ending resource. They don't have to go and renew it. They, they may feed it, feed, feed her uh, a couple times a day, but they don't have to go out and buy the drugs to, to sell again as well. So human trafficking is, is driven a lot by, by the drugs, or I'm sorry, by the gangs. Okay, well, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Um, Chief Model, it's, it's getting close to 6.30 and, and um, I, I don't know if we've got more questions. Um, thank you for providing some context to things. Um, and I, I guess it is, it does come down sometimes to, we have to agree to disagree, but, um, also, you know, thank you for all that you did during the riots, uh, on May 31st. And I hope that, um, you know, we can learn from that and, um, anyhow, but, but thank you so much. I really appreciate your time this evening. Thank you. Thank you all very much too for, for allowing me to talk to now. Happy to happy to do this again in the future if you're interested okay. as well. All right. Okay. Thank you, sir. Okay. Okay. Um commissioners, um, thank you for being here this evening. And um, um hopefully we found this to be uh productive and, and um um hopefully we can do this maybe quarterly and maybe after he uh, gets his shoulder fixed up and um come back and talk to us again. Um, but anyway, any last comments on um, how the evening went? Okay, so I guess we'll go ahead. I'll go. Yes, yeah, sir. Go ahead. Well, just just wanted to thank you all. Um, it's great to be on this board with you all, and uh, and I'm um, glad we were able to make this happen. So thanks, thanks for uh, thank you. you all. Okay, so our next meeting, Christina, is uh, is it May 18th that I see? Okay. And um, thank you, everyone. Um, have a great evening and uh, meeting adjourned. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye.